Wendy Hisco. I'm the director here at Brownell Library, and I wanted to welcome you here tonight. Um, I'd also like to thank our program sponsors, the statewide underwriters for the First Wednesday program, our Vermont Department of Libraries, National Life Group Foundation, and the Alma Gibbs Damchian Foundation. And the underwriter for this talk is the Vermont Council on World Affairs. Library underwriters are the Vermont Library Foundation, Covord Overton Wilson PC, the Essex Agency, Northfield Savings Bank, and RETN. I'd like to ask you now to please silence your cell phones. How many of you have never been to a First Wednesday program before? Great, welcome. In order to serve the general public as effectively as possible, the Humanities Council wants to know who's attending their programs, including how far people drive to attend First Wednesday programs. So there's a clipboard being passed around, and whether you've been to a, a Humanities Council program or not, please jot your information down so the Humanities Council can use that information for future funding. First Wednesdays is a program of the Vermont Humanities Council that happens usually on the first Wednesday of the month, October through May. This program has been postponed twice, as some of you are aware, due to the weather, but it is not snowing tonight, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, there's programs at nine libraries around the state of Vermont, and we're pleased to post the series here in this region of the state. There are audience feedback forms that are located in the hallway on your way out, and you can also fill the forms out electronically on the Humanities Council website. I'm pleased tonight to introduce Stanley Sloan, who's a visiting scholar in the political science at Middlebury College. He's a non-resident senior fellow at Scowcraft Center for the Atlantic Council of the United States, an associate fellow at the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy. Over the past decade, he's taught courses on transatlantic relations and on American power in Middlebury's winter term. For the past 25 years, he's lectured regularly at the NATO College in Rome, where he was named an honorary ancien in 2005. In 1999, he concluded government service as a congressional research senior specialist in international security <coughs> policy after 24 years in various CRS research and management positions. He served previously as the first deputy national intelligence officer for Western Europe at the Central Intelligence Agency and as a member of the U.S. delegation to new negotiations on mutual and balanced force reductions in Vienna, Austria. Stan is a native Vermonter who graduated from Montpelier High School in 1961 and from the University of Maine in 1965. He received his master's degree in international affairs from Columbia School of International Affairs in 1967. Stan is a distinguished graduate of the Air Force Officers School Training School and served as a combat intelligence officer in the Air Force. While employed by the CIA, Stan completed all but the dissertation for his PhD at American University. In recent years, Stan was the recipient of Fulbright Senior Specialist Grants to lecture at the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia and the Estonian School of Diplomacy in Tallinn. He has authored dozens of CRS studies, journal articles, opinion editorials, and books. His most recent books, book is Defense of the West, NATO, and the European Union, and the Transatlantic Bargain, as well as Transatlantic Traumas, correct? <laughs> okay, which is just coming out right now. So please join me in welcoming Stan. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out on this rainy night. It's a lot better than snow because you can see that twice this presentation has been canceled because of snow. And I'm glad to see that you all made it through the rain. I really, uh, that, that's actually the plan for my lecturing here at Brownell has been something that has been working between Wendy and me for over three years and ran into scheduling problems. And the first year that it didn't work, I ended up at the Ilsley Library in Middlebury for a first Wednesday, and actually was the first opportunity to talk about some of the, my early thinking about this subject that I'm going to talk about tonight. And then last year, I did a first Wednesday at my home library, the Kellogg Hubbard Library in Montpelier, Vermont, where uh, I did my youthful reading in their, in their youth room at that library. That was a great fun. But now I finally made it to Brownell, and I'm very happy to finally have the opportunity to do this. 
want to thank Brownell and also the sponsors. I'm not going to list all the ones that Wendy listed, but in particular the Vermont Humanities Council, which is the one that invites me to do this, and then also the Vermont Council on World Affairs, which is uh, the sponsor that's listed. I appreciate the sponsorship. My goal tonight is that you all will, hopefully all of you, will leave here believing that the topic for tonight is important to you and that you'll have some idea of what you're gonna do about it. Now, I won't give you guidance on, on everything, but I will give you some suggestions. And I will try to, to talk a bit about why it's important for everybody to be concerned about this topic. When I was, Wendy mentioned that I went to officer training school, so that was actually some 50 years ago. I hate to admit it, but all the stuff she listed, it takes a lot of years to do all of that. And the one thing that I remember most from officer training school is uh, the lecture that we got on how to give a military briefing. It was very simple, actually. The directions were, some of you may be familiar with this, you give them good military briefing by telling them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. <laughs> and in 50 years, the main thing that has changed about that is that they now recommend that you use PowerPoint, at least for some audiences. And I find particularly at the NATO College is very helpful because a good percentage of the audience are not uh, English speakers as their first language. They speak English, but it's not their first language. So the PowerPoint is reinforcing. In any case, you're going to get to see that approach tonight. So what will I tell you? I'm going to tell you that the West is defined by shared values, and I'm going to explain a little bit what that is and how that differs from other definitions of the West. The West has important institutional foundations. I know people get bored talking about, about institutions, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about them, but I'm going to point out why a couple of institutions on the international level are critically important. The West all of us, I think, have taken the West for granted for so many years now, particularly since the end of the Cold War. And now it's been challenged. I'm going to talk about those challenges. There were external challenges that came from Russia and are still coming from Russia and the Islamic State. And there are internal challenges as well. We've seen tides of illiberalism washing over Europe, and I'm going to talk a little bit about those. We've seen Turkey, which had been uh, aspirationally uh, a member of the NATO alliance that illustrated that a majority Muslim state could actually be part of the West and have a democracy. We'll talk about the trends of that President Erdogan is taking Turkey in away from the West. The Brexit decision by the British 2016 to leave the European Union was definitely another one of these illiberal tendencies come to uh, fruition in terms of the decision that was made there. And the Trump tsunami, as I call it, uh, crashed into our democracy, and I'm going to talk about that as well. And then at the end, I'll ask the question of whether illiberalism has brought the West to the brink of collapse. And I will talk a little bit about what my answer is at that point. And then the question of what can be done. And I will talk about something that I developed in my new book, Transatlantic Traumas, called radical centrist populism. That may sound very strange to you right now. It is kind of a strange term. I've had some political scientists who've told me they don't agree with my using that term, but I'll explain to you why, why I use that term. So I'm going to start out by showing a few political cartoons that basically are a summary of my presentation. The first one shows the United States and Europe fighting each other on the soccer pitch. And the coach of the team talking to the official says they'd be a good team if they spent more time kicking the ball and less time kicking each other. And that's very true about the Western Alliance. One of the things that is posing a challenge, obviously, is President Putin of Russia. And here's a, cartoon, a cover from The Economist, actually from, I think, three years ago now, illustrating that Putin was trying to meddle in Western democracies, and we know that he has been. At the same time in Europe, there was a threat coming from the South, the threat posed by the Islamic State, by Islamist terrorism, 
by the conflicts in Syria, North Africa, and the Middle East that led to many refugees coming into Europe and terrorism as well. And you can see the, the, uh, the, the fact that the, many people feared that the, all of the refugees coming into Europe were gonna bring many terrorists with them. And this became a popular argument or rationale for many of the, the right-wing radical populists in Europe. Then the question of, are we ending up now with a, a perfect storm in which a combination of these external threats from Russia and Islamist terrorism and the internal illiberal tendencies, whether that combination is going to end up as a perfect storm which brings the West down. And you can see in that picture uh, our favorite president, the one in the middle is Marine Le Pen, who was the leader of the radical Islamic, radical, radical right-wing party in France, and then Viktor Orban, the president of Hungary, who has recently declared that he thinks that illiberal democracy is a good thing. So, so first, the West is defined by unifying shared values. So what are the, the, the values that I'm talking about? The values are, to my mind, the values of liberal democracy define the West. Those are individual freedom, human rights, tolerance, and equality under the rule of law. And in many ways, the way that I look at the West and the way I describe it in my new book is that it's a basket of ideas. It's not anything that you can otherwise put your hand on. It's not territory, it's not a country, it's not a race, it's not a kind of people. And in fact, uh, these values that I think define the West are aspirational. So you wouldn't, shouldn't expect to look back in history and say, well, the West hasn't always lived up to those values, because it hasn't. We know it hasn't. Those are the values that we shoot for. They aren't always lived up to. And I think it's important to understand that the West is influenced but not defined by race culture, religion, language, nationalism, wealth, or other traits that actually tend to divide people rather than unite them. The values that I'm talking about are values that can operate with people irrespective of all of these considerations. And therefore, it's not the West that President Trump talked about. In, in Poland a year ago, he gave a speech in which he said that the West is the bonds of culture, faith, and tradition that make us who we are. Now, I don't think that's an appropriate definition. It's one that gets us in trouble. And in many ways, I think what it does is it creates divisions rather than unity. Uh, so th I think that this is the best definition of Western, Western values, and it certainly is the one that I use in my, in my book. So you, you have the question I've referenced already, and that is, do the values always rule? And the fact is, no. Security concerns obviously can and have disrupted the application of those values. In the West, we have histories of colonialism, economic imperialism. We have tolerated authoritarian regimes, for example, authoritarian governments for military juntas in the NATO alliance for periods of time. And we deal with despots. We deal with despots all the time. So the fact is that the values don't always determine what our country or other democracies do in their foreign relations. And there also is a danger of trying to impose Western values on others. And as you all know, we've gotten into a lot of trouble over recent history in trying to, oppose, trying to impose the values that we have that we think are great for us, but to get them in, working in other countries that aren't ready for them. And so I think it's an important thing to say that, that the values are important for us and they're important for countries that decide that they want to live by those rules but they shouldn't be imposed on other societies that are not prepared for them. Second point, the West has important institutional foundations. I told you I wouldn't spend a lot of time on institutions because institutional discussions can be very boring, but I think in this case there are two institutions that are critically important. One is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and it's important not just because I spent my entire career working on that organization, but because it also embodies the values that I say define the West. And look at the preamble of the North Atlantic Treaty, which lists those values very clearly. Democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. And we all know that democracy, everybody thinks democracy is a great thing, but some people think it's just voting. 
And the fact is that if you don't have all of the elements of a democracy, including a free press, and including an uh, independent judiciary system under the rule of law, your democracy is not going to be what we like to define as a true liberal democracy in the West. The second article is, I won't go into great detail here, the second article is called the Canadian Article because Canada in 1949 insisted that the North Atlantic Treaty Organization also uh, be an instrument for promoting peace. And the other critical articles, three, four, and five, lead to uh, five is the collective defense commitment that all of the allies in the alliance will regard an attack on one of them as an, attack, an attack on all of them. And so that's the commitment that um, has been unquestioned in the history of the alliance by the United States and other governments until President Trump came along. But it's the critical commitment made by the allies in defense not only of their territory and the sovereignty of the members, but of the values in that treaty. The other institution that I'm talking about is the European Union. European Union, uh, in many, many documents, articulates its perspective on the values that are very similar to the ones articulated in the North Atlantic Treaty. And you can see the ones that I've highlighted there it basically focus on freedom, equality, solidarity based on the principles of democracy and the rule of law. You'll find that in most definitions that, are, that fit the liberal, uh, liberal democracy definition include both democracy and the rule of law along with individual rights of, of uh, people. Now what happened is that I think since the end of the Cold War, we tended to take the West for granted. There were even books written about how uh, it had brought the, the, uh, the basically the, the end of history. And uh, I think to some extent we, we took that for granted, that things were going to be fine and we didn't need to have things like NATO. We didn't need to worry too much about threats to the country. By the way, this picture I took, I was very fortunate to be in Berlin just a matter of days after the Berlin Wall was breached. And I took this picture with a disposable camera uh, and with a feeling of this was, this is at the Brandenburg Gate, obviously, and those are East German guards standing on the, on the, Branden, on the wall. And actually, to tell the truth, you can't see out of the picture, down to the left-hand side of the picture, uh, were some West German girls, and the East German guards were flirting with the <laughs> West German girls. So it opened up all kinds of worlds other, in addition to the ones that we, that we know about. But the fact is that when this came, when this time came, there was an assumption basically that uh, we didn't have much to worry about anymore, and the West was, had won. We were victorious. Now, unfortunately, the, uh, I think the West has become vulnerable to a couple of things, and it's in, in some ways it's a combination. The external threats posed by Russia and Islamist terrorism and the, the combination between Russia, Russia's meddling and the terrorism have led to special problems for all of the countries in the West. And uh, those challenges not only have posed physical problems and issues for the Western states, but it's called into question the whole idea of the West and the way it's applied in our democracies and the institutions of NATO and the European Union. So talk a little bit about, about those threats. The first one being the threat from Russia. Uh, Vladimir Putin performed a public service for Russia when he brought the chaos of the 1990s to an end. There's no question about that. And in the early 1990s, I believe strongly that Russia would go through another authoritarian period in which uh, it would go back to an imposition of fairly strong central rule as an, a way of ending the chaos of the 1990s. And in doing this, Putin used the threat of the West and the threat of NATO to sustain domestic support. He still does that. He argues that there are foreign enemies and the international system works against Russia, which to some extent it does. And he wants to establish his own kind of international dynamics and system that favor Russia more. And to a great extent, as we found out in the 2016 elections here, and as other countries, other democracies found out, 
he has successfully meddled in Western elections and caused great disruption, uh, seeking to destroy faith of Western populations in those systems. And here is, uh, you probably think that I'm a big fan of The Economist since this is a second Economist cover. This is one from just a few weeks ago. And uh, this shows Putin, uh, obviously, as the meddler in Western democracies. And uh, that, he, that he is. Now moving on to the, the second external threat, and this is the one of, uh, posed by the Islamic State. And it's, it's, I know it's strange to put Russia and the Islamic State together in sort of the two major threats to Western democracies. But the fact is that both the Islamic State and Russia aim to change the Western system, aim to change Western democracies. And from the point of view of the Islamic State, it saw the West and Western civilization as a threat to the way that they thought life should be lived. And um, fortunately, as President Trump will brag about, the Islamic State has been reduced dramatically in terms of the area physically that it, that it controls. Problem is, the Islamic State is more than just a controller of territory. It's an idea. It's, a, it's an idea that's contrary to West, to the West, to the West that we think about. Uh, so the terrorist attacks managed successfully to not only uh, to threaten Western populations, to provide fertile ground for Western uh, right-wing uh, right populist leaders, but also creating a huge issue in Western Europe by sending refugees across the Mediterranean into European countries, and particularly the southern tier of European countries felt much more threatened than the northern tier, and the northern tier was feeling more threatened by Russia. So this created huge disruption in terms of European unity and a perception of a common threat. And the fact is that this combination of Islamic terrorism, the conflicts in the Middle East, and the Russian threat created fertile soil on which illiberal politicians could gain ground throughout Europe. But what about these illiberal tides spreading across Europe? I won't go into each one, but the Front National in, in Paris, one of the more successful ones, uh, did not succeed, obviously, in the elections. And uh, Emmanuel Macron, who just had a successful visit to, to the United States, won the election, but the fact is that the Front National became the strongest opposition party in those elections and still poses a continuing threat to democracy in France. A right-wing radical party for the first time won significant seats in the German Bundestag last year and made it very difficult for Angela Merkel to create a government. The uh, largest uh, MS5 radical right populist group in Italy just won uh, a lot of seats in the Italian parliament and there still is not a new government as a result of their victory and the fact is that the Italian parliament now features not only the MS5 but also the Northern League, both parties that are more populist and right wing than anything else. The campaign that forced the British to leave uh, the European Union or start the process of leaving the European Union was brought about by an illiberal party. And uh, we have radical or right-wing leaning parties in a number of European countries. Hungary is as notable as any. Poland is a very notable. The Czech Republic, Austria, and the Swiss governments all have strong leanings or dominant leanings toward the radical right. Now there are some common ingredients among these parties and you may recognize some of them in, the, in what we have in the United States as well. And it's important to think about these common ingredients. They all try to steer, stir up fears of, of immigrants. Uh, they promise strong leadership and uh, they tend to try to seek to undermine institutions including the press and independent judiciary. They tend to oppose or be critical of NATO and the European Union. Why? These are the two institutions that represent the West. 
They cynically use appeals to religion. We've seen that, I think, with President Trump and uh, certainly, President Putin has used the Russian Orthodox Church and his ties to that as, I think, a very cynical political uh, move on his part as well. In fact, uh, in some places, he's referred to as the uh, Saint, Saint Vladimir. Um, and many of these right-wing radical you know, leaders around Europe and Trump all admire President Putin's strong leadership style. So these are all common features of uh, that radical right-wing uh, populist candidates tend to follow. There's one major exception, and that is in Poland, a right-wing radical party is in control now, but because of Poland's history, uh, Poland does not, does not admire President Putin or Russia, <laughs> and that's a major exception to, to that general rule. And what is happening is that these right-wing radical parties are using our political system, which is open, which invites them in many ways to participate. And uh, in fact, there is a growing connection between European radical right parties and the right wing in the United States. And just one recent indication of this was that at the Republican Conservative Political Action Conference that took place not long ago, both Marine Le Pen and uh, Frange from the UK both came and spoke to the, that conference. Okay, uh, a few words on Turkey because Turkey is, is uh, once was a huge success story for the West. Uh, NATO was very proud to have this country that uh, had established democracy uh, and uh, had a, a great uh, let's say, tradition, democratic tradition that was begun by Ataturk way back when. And for NATO to have a majority Muslim country that was a secular democracy was a huge benefit for the alliance and something that NATO countries in the West thought might help inspire other governments in the region and in the Middle East to find that they could, being Muslim, moder majority Muslim countries, could still be secular democracies. And NATO, in fact, has relied on Turkey as an outpost facing toward the Middle East in, uh, throughout, throughout most of the alliance's history. The problem is now, President Erdogan shows all of the traits that I mentioned before that, uh, that are characteristic of populist political leaders. And this kind of uh, turn to our more, toward a more authoritarian style of governance in Turkey is concerning. Uh, and, and we've seen already Erdogan has been cozying up to President Putin. He displays that respect for Putin that I suggested as a general trait. And I think it's important to say Turkey is not yet a lost cause, but uh, it is on the brink. There's no question about that. And what's interesting is you can f take a look in uh, June, there will be snap elections that Erdogan has called thinking that uh, he might be able to solidify his control of the country with those elections. The opposition, it seems, is trying to get its act together and not be divided and try to work together against Erdogan. So those elections could be critical in terms of the way that Turkey moves in the future. But in any case, this is another part of that illiberal tide that has been sweeping over the, uh, the Western alliance. Brexit, there's absolutely no doubt about this, that the party that led the Brexit case was this United Kingdom Independence Party, uh, which is a characteristic right-wing radical populist party and uh, played on the fears of the British and managed to get the, the referendum to leave the European Union uh, by one or two uh, points in the referendum. There were a lot of mistakes made by the British government at the time. David Cameron, who had promised a, a referendum on the, on the future of the UK in the European Union, he probably never should have done that. And it's a huge question now whether uh, what the outcome of these negotiations that are going on between the UK and the European Union, how, how they will turn out. The UK will not leave the West when he leaves the European Union. It will be still a very solid member of the West. 
and it will not destroy NATO. It will still be a member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, but it will weaken the European Union, and I think it will also weaken the UK. And it also is already very satisfying for President Putin, whose objective is to weaken those institutions, NATO and the European Union. And there's no question about what the departure of the UK from the European Union does weaken the West. And the question is how much uh, this can be compensated for by the arrangements that are made uh, for this departure of the UK. Those negotiations are ongoing. Okay, we could spend at least another hour or 20 or 30 on this question, and we're not, not going to do that. But the fact is that the victor, victory of President Trump in the United States was a huge shock coming after the Brexit shock as well, and uh, brought along with the victory a lot of challenges to the assumptions that have been underlying American foreign policy for 70 years, and uh, it obviously the campaign that Trump won was what I call a quint quintessential populist campaign. He played on popular fears. This is what a lot of populist, right-wing populist leaders do. They play on concerns that people have and they play them up and they exaggerate, and exaggerate them. They take the normal fears that people have and they play them up to a higher level. And this is in many ways what President President Trump did during the campaign. And you saw all of the, the attempts to promote uh, fear and hate and uh, divide, dividing people. And it, uh, it's uh, in many ways, if you look at Trump, he fits right in to the right-wing populist candidates in Europe. It is, uh, it's ironic that President Trump has been far more critical of our European allies than he has been of Putin. Now we see an exception to that in the last couple of days because here the president of France has been spectacular, if you think about it. He's, uh, he pursued a strategy and he's been doing this uh, ever since he came to power of, uh, of complimenting Trump and playing up to him in a way that he hopes will lead him to be able to influence Trump's decisions. And we've seen in the last couple of days the possibility that he in fact will do that Although once he leaves town, we don't know what <laughs> Trump will do. And uh, some people now are, uh, a year ago, when Angela Merkel had met with Trump, uh, there were stories written about how Angela Merkel now was going to be the leader of the West. And now I've seen a few stories about how, no, no, it's, it's Emmanuel <coughs> Macron who's going to be the leader of the West. The fact is that I think it's impossible for the leader of any other country than the United States to be the leader of the West. Uh, they can be a strong influence, and I would say right now, Macron makes a very good voice for the West, but the only effective leader of the West really can be the United States. And this suggests to me that the West is gonna be without leadership for the rest of the Trump presidency, because he really has abdicated leadership of the West. And uh, that means that the West does not have a strong leader and the fact is that even this image that Ronald Reagan favored of the shining city on a hill no longer appears to be uh, the image that other countries see have when they think of the United States. And what concerns me is that one of the first steps toward establishing an authoritarian or an autocratic regime is placing limits on a free press. And we've already seen, uh, and we see day in and day out, the tendencies demonstrated by President Trump to weaken the influence of the mainstream press. He has his own sources that he thinks are great, and they talk the same line, uh, but for the most part, he is undermining the free press in the United States with his, his constant tweets. He also, uh, after taking that approach, has been very, has, uh, has worked very hard to try to undermine the system of in the independent judiciary. From the very beginning, he would attack judges that made the wrong decisions that he disagreed with. He's attacked the FBI, he's attacked the whole, the whole intelligence community. And so those are the signs of uh, someone who does not believe in liberal democracy, who is trying to create a different kind of a system. 
Now, it may be that he doesn't really know what he's trying to create, but, but the tendencies are worrisome all the same. So here we come to the question, has illiberalism brought the West to the brink of collapse? That's a subtitle of my book, by the way. That's, uh, so is this the, the end of the West? And it's something that we all ought to think about because we all live in a state that is very much a Western state. When I talk about Vermont, and if you look at the excerpts from the Vermont Constitution in the, in the State House, you can see how the values that Vermonters have held throughout its history are so much a reflection of, of the Western values that we believe in today. Well, I, I don't believe that it's the, the end of the West. I'm not ready to throw in the towel because I think the fact that we're in a democracy and we know how to make it work, we, ha we have the possibility for making it work. And my argument is that the political center needs to be reinvigorated. What do I mean by that? I mean the political center has basically given up a lot of ground to the right-wing radical populace. And two years ago, a little more than two years ago, when I talked about the early stages of this issue at the Ilsley Library in Middlebury, when I talked about the populist, concern about populists, a couple, the Vermont couple came up to me after the talk and said, you should be more careful about how you use that, that term populist because you know, it's not necessarily a bad thing. And I thought, you know, they're really right. And what's bad is the way that right-wing radical populists use the, that appeal. And so I started adjusting uh, my approach to reflect their concern. And I end up by saying it's not, it's, the goal is not to defeat populism, but to respond for the political center, to respond more effectively to popular fears and concerns. And that doesn't mean that political centrists have to use the tactics that right-wing radicals use, but it means we have to find ways as political centrists to deal with the concerns, legitimate concerns that people have, to deal with the fears that people have, that without playing to those and exaggerating them, find out how we can deal more effectively with those, with those concerns. So the solution that I come up with, that I talk about in my book, is the thing I call radical centrist populism. As I suggested earlier, I've had some, particularly some European political scientists say, no, you can't use populism that way. That, that doesn't work. And the problem is that Europeans, uh, in, I have learned since I got that reaction, tend to see the word populism as meaning right-wing populism. That's how it's interpreted, particularly by political scientists in Europe. And as you know, populism in the United States, we find both on the left and the right. We had a, a left-wing populist running for president, Bernie Sanders, we all know him. In fact, I worked on European security policy for Bernie Sanders. That was, uh, I was asked to do that for his campaign, and I tried to develop a centrist approach to security in Europe that, uh, would, that he would be able to rely on. He never made any speeches on foreign policy, so my work uh, it eventually went into the platform, I guess, in the end, but in any case, it, not to any speeches that Bernie made. But in any case, we know that populism can produce advocates on the left as well as on the right. I was talking about the, the fact that we have left-wing populism in the United States as well as right-wing. And I think we need centrist populism. And I don't see anything wrong with that. And the approach that I develop in my book suggests that this doesn't have to be something that is vanilla. In other words, it doesn't have to be just everything's a compromise. Although I think compromise is not a dirty word. It's the way the democracies work. Uh, things get done in the center of the political spectrum. The right and the left get all of the attention, but the work gets done in the center. We haven't been doing much work lately because the center has been ineffective. But there's no reason why the political center can't take good ideas that come from the left and good ideas that come from the right and adapt them and find compromise approaches. Now, I think that the, the center can be progressive, creative, and make democracy work for, not only for Americans, but it can make it work for our European allies as well. So, what have I told you? Told you that the values that underlie the West are critically important. We rely on them every day here in Vermont for our lives, the way we live our lives, the way we run our government. 
The radical right populists have played to the fears and concerns of people and given themselves greater influence than they should have. And now it's come to the point where I think Western values and the West in general are in danger and the Western governments in Europe and in the United States have to respond more effectively to the concerns of the average person, have to try to rebuild the center and here in the United States we're talking about building it on a combination of the Democratic Party, independents, and Republicans who are dissatisfied with Trump. There you have the makings for rebuilding a political center. So I call this approach radical centrist populism, and I hope that this approach, and I don't care what it's called as long as the concept is one that, uh, is that, that we follow here in the United States and that our European allies follow as well. And I look forward to hearing your comments and questions. I hope I've given you enough to, to chew on and enough to call base your questions on. This is a little bit of an ad for my book called Transatlantic Traumas. It is available now in the United States. It came out first in the UK and, and uh, in Europe, and it now is available at almost any place. And there will be a book event at Phoenix Books in Burlington on the 15th of May at 7 p.m. So thank you very much for being attentive listeners, and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thanks. Please. of this 21st century as we move ahead, uh, what the role might be in the areas that you talked about of China? I, in, in my book, I of course have to say, this is, we're not going to take into account uh, China and for that matter there are democracies and there are illiberal movements in Asia as well. Right. And I narrowed it down to talk about the transatlantic relationship, mm -hmm. particularly that's my area yes. of specialization. China is an incredibly important question, but you know, I, and I, I, I was lecturing in London a couple, 10 days ago, and in both of the sessions at the International Institute of Strategic Studies and Royal United Services Institute, I was asked about China, which is very logical. And my answer is what concerns me about China is the internal conflict between their liberalizing, the liberalizing economy and their constrained democracy, or constrained political system. And I wonder at what point will this opening up of the, the economic system will come into conflict with that constraints on the political system and create some kind of huge explosion. And I don't think there's anything that we in the West can do about that, but that's what worries me most. I think we have to be worried about uh, some aggressive behaviors by China, but for the most part, I see them as largely a status quo power. And it's one that we can't do a lot about because we're mutually interdependent. Uh, they hold a lot of our debt, we buy a lot of their products. And so we, are, we have a lot of, of interest in the future of China. But that's the thing that worries me most, is that conflict between their, the economic liberalism that they have and people being you know, lots of millionaires in China now, billionaires, and uh, the fact that the political still system is still uh, very constrained and with no sign of opening up, if anything, even closed more, with Xi being elected now for life, I guess, or at least that's the, pos the way that we're where we are at the moment. So that, that's how I see China. Please. So, one of the both internal and external forces that are, are that I think are driving this conversation really is globalism, and and it um, the effects that it's had <coughs> on uh, the economies within Europeans, you know, within Western world, but also in the other worlds, even just emerging economies like India. We have just great gulfs between the haves and the have-nots. And um, I guess I'd love to hear your, th your thoughts around what, what role, just the idea of globalism and the way that we have uh, seen capitalism be part of the Western idea 
and the excruciating side effects of capitalism, both in our own countries, but that spill out onto the other international stage as well. I think you hit on a, a real challenge because, in fact, one of the things that uh, that the right-wing radical populists play on is this globalism. You know, this is great, one of the great enemies. Uh, because it means that you're looking out more for the concerns of other people than, than the concerns of your own people. And that is, that is uh, in many ways, a myth that has been created by the right wing. And, but it is also a source of a real concern. And I think it will be a challenge for the United States, uh, particularly after Trump, to find a way to balance our concern about global issues, including uh, the welfare of other people, the economy, the, the environment. Uh, I don't know how we can escape from this. I think Emmanuel Macron, was, uh, talking to the Congress today, was very effective in saying <coughs> problems can't be solved purely on a national basis. They have to be solved on a multilateral or international basis. And I think that's the fundamental reality. And the sooner that the United States gets back to working along those lines, the better the international system will function. Right now, I mean, it is so frustrating because you cannot deal effectively with global issues with the United States on the sidelines. And that's where we are. And that's uh, unfortunately where we're probably going to stay for a little while. I, I could only share your concern about, about uh, the future in that area. So, I was wondering, since you were talking a little bit about India, how would you characterize their democracy? Because, you know, it's supposedly the biggest democracy on the planet. But I think if most of us were to look at what we know about the situation there, it almost does not seem like a democracy. Who's democracy? India? India. India. <coughs> I really don't know enough about India to answer that question effectively. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, you, I, I find your, your term illiberalism kind of an interesting thing. It's the first time I've heard the term. Would you characterize them as being illiberal? from what you know about him, just as a, an ordinary person. It, there are those who would consider um, India a part of the West, but you could also consider it as having some very strong illiberal tendencies as well. I just don't know enough to come down. I, I obviously will have to study that more, because it's a great question. Please. Uh, a basic question. What is your definition of liberalism? Of what? Of liberalism. <coughs> what is the definition of that? The, the, my definition of liberalism, or de liber il no, liberal democracy, is a belief in democracy, individual liberty, the equality under the rule of law. And if you follow, basically, then you can add in human rights, you can add in tolerance, add in a few other factors. But I think those elements are the elements of liberal democracy that I think define both uh, what the West is and what we aspire to. We don't always come out perfectly in, in all those categories. But those are the, to my mind, the, the, the goals that we aim for as uh, creating liberal democracy and, and sustaining liberal democracy. Over here, please. I would add to that that a respect for science is a way to know true facts about the world that we live in. And uh, that's notably absent from uh, our current president. I can only agree. It is <laughs> respect for science critically important. To what extent that is, um, I mean, respect for the truth and for facts is critically important. And that goes into that basket. And so that, uh, I think that is, it is critically important to have that as the underlying uh, strength of democracy. You have to have faith in facts, the truth, science, or else you will not have a functioning, effective democracy. Please. Ecology is global, and the fate of all of us depends upon ecology. Ecology. Equality? No, ecology. Sorry. Ecology. This I'm agree with our science. Technology. Ecology is a change <coughs> better at it than we are. Technology. No, not technology. Ecology. E C. E C O L. The ecosystem. Oh. Okay. And the question is? 
It's global. Yes. And, and we, uh, all, our lives de our, all our lives depend on, on sound ecology and, and scientists. Yes. Yeah. I agree. It's, uh, we cannot solve most problems on our own. We have to solve them with other countries. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. We in the back. Do you have a way to go back to a particular slide? There was a sentence um, at the top of the tidal wave of illiberalism slide that I found puzzling. Do you want to go back to that? I think I can remember enough about it to ask my question. Um, there was something it had to do with the election in France. Yeah. Um, and the fact that apparently uh, Russia Putin, and Trump supported the national, whatever that other party was, there we go. Um, yeah. yeah, the, uh, the, the uh, National Front in yeah. France got a lot of financial assistance from the Russians. And Trump, according to this, the second sentence, now the radical right front national party in France, blah, 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 received money from Putin and support from Trump. So that's confusing to me given how friendly Trump and Macron were, were over the last 24 hours or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the way to look at uh, President Macron's approach is that it was a brilliant strategy and okay, trying to disarm, to disarm Trump and with friendship and he has his own agenda and if you listen particularly to his speech to the Congress you find out what his agenda is. He's also, he has a large ego but he's a very, very capable, smart man and I think the strategy he pursued in the last few days was brilliant. Yeah. Whether it will have a lasting effect, I think, is another question. That's what uh, I thought. I just wanted to clarify that a little bit. Okay. Thank you. Back there, please. Uh, the center of the conversation about all this for the last couple of years has been Trump. Everything Trump has done. But it seems to me this has been a, a well laid out, orchestrated plan that started back in the 70s, uh, especially when they eliminated the Fairness Doctrine by the Federal Communications Commission that you could use radio stations almost as political operatives. And then you have people like Rush Limbaugh came along and Sean Hannity, and you created, and what was amazing about this as I watched it happen was people who I knew were well-educated, very successful in business, they latched onto this uh, in an almost cult-like manner. They would listen to Rush Limbaugh every day. And what has happened here with Donald Trump is just the final, he is just the final effect of that 40 years of attack on liberalism. And that, that is just not Trump, but it goes way back. And even if Trump is voted out, that horse does not go away. Yeah, that's true. I think there's a lot, a lot to that. I think you also have to look at the fact that the Republican Party at the beginning of the Obama administration basically said we're going to do everything we can to ensure that he is not successful. Mm -hmm. And if you add that to your, your factor, I think that is what produced the conditions that, that, got us, that got us Trump. Now, obviously there were a lot of other things that came into play at the end. He didn't get a majority. He's got this hardcore, which I guess the latest poll now says 39%. But he's got this hardcore of support. It doesn't seem to change a lot, not fundamentally. And no matter what happens, it seems to seem to get that hardcore. And I think they are thoroughly conditioned in part by the circumstances you, you talk about, the, uh, the commentators, the right-wing commentators. And, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, the, that's been incredibly effective propaganda, no question about it. Please. Yeah, um, I find your uh, portraying the, the center as being the solution, which is very intriguing and I certainly I think it makes, makes a whole lot of sense. But of course, the problem is, is um, it's not very exciting <laughs> as, you, as you relate to the, the two extremes. The electricity of the last election was on the left with, with Bernie and on the right with you know who. And we had the 19 puppets, puppets uh, in the uh, 
uh, you know, in the campaign that, that just dropped off uh, one by one. And so um, it makes you think, how is it going to resolve itself? Is there, is there going to be a, 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 a electrifying personality who, who may rise uh, from the center? Or uh, is, the, is the, this uh, tribalism and the, the ashes, you use the word, the Phoenix book, uh, reminds me, out of the ashes of what we're, we're dealing with, we're going to have to you know, start all over and, and hopefully we don't uh, get destroyed. So it, it, it very, as much as I, I, I like the, the notion, I, I find it very, uh, very challenging. Oh, it's no, no doubt about that. In fact, I say in my book that there, this is a lot easier said than done. And unfortunately, that's true. And for one thing, the center does need some kind of strong uh, political leadership. And so far, it's not there. You don't, don't see it. Uh, perhaps one of the best possibilities is somebody who's just too old to do that. And Joe Biden, I think, probably could fit in that role. But we need somebody from the younger generation will pick up that, and more than one person, hopefully, will pick up that role. And it's, so it's, it's not, not easy. It does require political leadership, but it also requires everyone going out with that idea in mind. And when a, I had a, a graduate student at King's College uh, ask me a question at the Royal United Services Institute, he said, you've got this great idea, but how do you make it work? And I said, political action voting, being involved. If you believe in this approach, go out and do something about it. And that's what I would say to you as well. That we, and in Vermont it's a little bit easier because we tend to be a centrist state. We, uh, even when we have a Republican governor, we tend to be, be centrist. And it's, um, it's, it's hard because we don't, if you believe as I do, that we need to get the center working. Um, when we vote in Vermont, it's sort of, we know what the outcome is going to be, and uh, critical races are elsewhere. But I think there still are things that Vermonters can do to influence outcomes, and I think it's important to have that voice out there. And also to demonstrate that uh, Vermont is a, is a state that does find it possible to work in the center. And I think that is, that is pretty much how this state works. It doesn't always work perfectly, but I think that we've got more of an idea of how to make the center work than many other states do. I just you, you showed a list of countries that have gone right wing. Um, and obviously, Putin had a hand in messing around in the United States. Do you think? Uh, influence those countries, those parties, to be successful there? It certainly has influenced some of them, no question. I don't have access to intelligence on what no, happened at all. What do the Europeans think when you, you talk to them, what do they think? I think they, they feel that there has been meddling. There certainly is a, a lot of messaging, and a lot of what Putin, what Russia did in the United States uh, was the messaging. And we started to see that you now through Facebook and, and the way that they used uh, our political system. And uh, so I, I don't know whether uh, other parties, other right-wing parties, have gotten money from the Russians. I suspect they have, because it is in the open that the Front National got plenty of money from Russia. I assume other right-wing parties have gotten money as well. And right-wing politicians that are in, in control, like Viktor Orban in Hungary, has gotten economic deals from, from Russia, gas deal, for example, and has welcomed it. Uh, so there are, there are inducements that Russia and Putin has used in order to influence the political thinking of uh, people in those countries. But I think the most, the most effective thing has been to encourage the right-wing politicians to play on the fears of the public and uh, messaging is, is a, one very effective way of doing that. And I think the Russians have been very thoroughly engaged in that, not just in the United States, but in Europe as well. Please. I have a question at you. Just uh, your opinion on the uh, 
Could you speak up a little bit, please? I would like you to comment on the uh, silent coup d'etat that's going on in the United States right now and began right after the last election, trying to discredit Trump, undermine him, uh, do away with the election. Just, how do you read that one? You've got to have a little balance here. Everything you've done is left wing. Right? That's a little bit back to the center. Can somebody closer up to me repeat that question? I, I just can't, can't get your voice. I'm sorry. <coughs> a lot of your comments have been about the, about the far right. Well, the basic problem is the far left. That's the undermining problem. So I'm just wondering uh, what your opinion might be on the silent coup d'etat that's been underway since the last election. The problem you think is on the far left. Yeah, no question. That's what propelled Trump into the, into the, into the uh, White House right now. Would you describe Hillary Clinton as being on the far left? Oh, God, yes. Hmm? Yeah, well, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we'll probably disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> Hillary Clinton, I think. When you're taking down foreign government to, to fund your, your crime family foundation, you've got to put her out there on the far left. Uh, I, I would I would disagree with that That's fine. description. I respect, I respect your opinion. I hope you respect mine. <laughs> sure. Uh, Anybody else? Please. There are so many distractions within the United States who are being effective in how we're dealing with this. And one of them, for example, is the unity amongst the states because the states each have their own opinions and they do not accept the diversity from one state to another. And that's passed right on down. Uh, politically, it, it, it's passed along. And so it gets, when we get to water, for example, one state's going to be fighting the other as to who owns the water. And uh, we aren't doing a thing about that. And it's a very big distraction. Anyway, the other thing is that the, I'm in the technical area myself, these people are, everybody around here I think is. But the, what we have done has brought a lot of comfort to the world. Everything that's happened in the last 20 years has happened because of building of a chip and uh, in, in the sense of how we have extended our capabilities and everything. But now there are people saying, well, these technical people, they're, you know, they're doing no good. And uh, it isn't that, it's, it's the people who use it incorrectly that is, uh, that is a problem. But the, um, I feel very strongly that, that uh, this is, I think you've given an excellent talk here. And I, I think that every one of us should be taking that back. But this group, I, I'm a visitor here quite often. This group does take things seriously. And uh, how do we get other people to take it just as seriously? Because we were with you before you even got here. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about preaching to the choir, right? <laughs> well, no, it's, 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 it was excellent. I, I, well, I, I, I'm I, just saying, how do you, my friends in Europe, my friends in Japan, my friends in Singapore and the like, they had much fun with me because I'm a liberal, and they uh, and and Trump, of course. Of course, now it's getting to be a serious thing, and uh, and it's becoming more and more and more serious. And uh, how do you think that our acceleration of doing something? Do you think it can match the change that's taking place more rapidly, perhaps at this moment? because of someone like Trump, the, the negative side. And it seems to have grown considerably. How are we going to accelerate the ideas that you're, the acceptance of these ideas? It's, it's certainly more than a challenge. Part of the problem is that it's a lot easier to motivate people based on fear than based on hope. And what we're talking about a lot of the time is we can hope for this and work for that. And unfortunately, people are much more motivated by fear. This is something that actually I wrote about for the Congress in the early 1990s when George H.W. Bush came up with a proposal for a new world order. 
And I suggested in a report for Congress that, in fact, the main problem here was that getting people to, mo to act based on hope was much more difficult than based on fear. We have to fight that, that fundamental factor. Yeah. And that's why you have to come back to facts. You know, without facts, you don't know the truth. Without the truth, you have no wisdom. And, that's, and there are people who are not accepting the truth. Mm -hmm. and, I and think that the center has to become much more effective in using media, using modern technology, and getting the facts out there and making the case. And that's something that I think, the, the, uh, particularly on the right, they've done much more effectively than people in the center. And it isn't as exciting. No question about that. It's not as exciting as the proposals that come from the extreme. But I think, to some extent, the American people may be ready for a little boring now. And if you have a logic for it, if you have a rationale for it, and that is that we can get things done in the center by making compromises, and there are some people in Congress who are willing to go down that road, we need to grow those numbers. You, you have many students. And how do they react? Because all of my grandchildren, I think, are thinking the same as you. Mm -hmm. I, I find, yes, I find the younger generations very much think along these lines. I've been teaching at Middlebury in their winter term now for 14 years, and so I've seen quite a few classes go through. And, uh, and in fact, on this book, I had three of my students working as research assistants who truly became collaborators with me on the book. And they had great ideas. They not only did great research, but they had ideas as well. And I, I worked with those ideas, and I regard the three of them. And they'll be, if you get a copy of my book, you'll see where I give how I give them credit in the preface. So I look to these young people. I'm always one reason why I keep teaching is I say teaching is always being a student. I'm always learning, right. and uh, that that is what keeps me going. I enjoy it, uh, and I think these young people are what we can hope in for the future. So, Please. Just, uh, for me, final remark anyway. Um, for some of you who might be wondering where do you start to do something, there's a group called Rights and Democracy, which if you Google it, it's here in Vermont. Uh, it might strike you at first as being a little too far left, but it's a great place to start to learn about what you can do and where you can do it. So I just encourage people to check into rights and democracy. <coughs> Thank you. Please. Would you consider the French President Macron a centrist? Yes, I definitely consider him a centrist. I think he's, he's um, that's where his appeal is largely. He appeals also to French nationalism. And it's funny, he talks against nationalism, but he also is a French nationalist, no question about that. But I, I think he's very centrist and uh, a fairly creative one. The proof is that he's got everybody mad at him. <laughs> <laughs> well, because he, he isn't the only one that doesn't like pro-immigration. In well, he sense, spoke, but he's, he's been speaking up. He speaks up for Europe. He definitely speaks up for Europe. He did. He did also in his speech to Congress today. But I always, when I when I think about France, I think this is a country that is more like the United States than any other in the world, because we both have great pride in our, our in our countries, and we are both nationalistic. The French are more nationalistic than almost any other country and Europe. And so when they talk about integration in the European Union, it's basically, it's got to be sort of on their terms for it, for it to work. So it's, I, when he talks about moving the European Union forward, I have to take that with a, a grain of salt. I think he believes it, but I think he also believes that it has to be consistent with preserving French national um, sovereignty. And that's always been, the French have always talked a really good game on European integration. But the fact is they, they always have been very defensive about their own sovereignty. And I think that will continue, and I think he still, he reflects that reality. He seems like he straddles the fence because he's not really for immigration, but he's 
less against it than Marine Le Pen, and he's not really for unions and the, and the work week in France and some of the social issues, but he is for free trade and the climate change, you know, so he has to kind of straddle the fence, but when you're centrist, it seems like you don't, you don't stand for anything. Because you're on on both sides. I think it is possible to be a centrist and to stand for things. And he stands, he stands, and you have to look at every looking at the process of European integration is a whole nother set of questions. And uh, my first job at the CIA was actually as a European community desk officer. So I started out working on European community issues and I've always followed them to some extent. What I think a lot of people don't realize is that nationalism is still very much alive in Europe, and in spite of all of the pleas for uh, greater integration, the fact is that it's not going to move very fast, in fact, it's going to move more. Some people saw the UK as the big obstacle to further integration. The fact is that many of the countries are, and France is uh, leading among them. France believes in a Europe d'état, in other words, a combination of states working together as Europe. I don't think France or Macron actually believe in uh, a United States of Europe, in other words, giving up sovereignty and depositing sovereignty in Brussels. And I don't, just don't think that's the French image. And I don't think politically he'd survive with that kind of position. I don't think he believes in it. So, uh, Le Pen is, is strongly against the European Union and NATO. So he's got plenty of room there between Le Pen and himself to differentiate, make it clear what he stands for. And in France, the most important thing for him to stand for is France. So, Please. so now you've tricked a question in my mind. Um, I lived in France for a while, so I agree with you completely. I kind of like that myself. But how about the rest of the countries, the Swiss and Austrians and Czechs, the Hungarians, etc.? Are they, they're not that pro giving up all of that power either. It's kind of a amalgam of we have to do this, right? And is this helping the conservative, the right-leaning parties? Well, <coughs> to some extent, I think the centrism of the European Union, and of course, this isn't the answer. I mean, the Swiss have an interesting situation. I've listed them because their national government is right-wing. But the independent, the strength of the canton sort of moderates that, and, and it's not as bad. Austria has a very strong right-wing government now. So, and Hungary, as I mentioned already. But the fact is, yes, that the centrism promoted by the European Union has tended to create more ground for more territory for right-wing populists to draw uh, support. The reason is that one of the I can't go into I haven't been able to go into all of the arguments, but one of the arguments that I make in the book is about the United States and about Europe. And that is the feeling of the average person is that they've been in a sense disenfranchised, that they're too distant from decisions being made. And that in some ways for Americans, uh, too many Americans look at Washington as a source of constraints on what they would normally do. And this is one way Trump has benefited greatly from playing on this issue. There are a lot of areas where I think even the center could do some great rationalization of the regulations and controls on the life of Americans. In Europe, I think a lot of Europeans who are in the, um, whose countries are in the European Union feel that decisions are being made in Brussels that affect their life. Like, what they should call their cheese and how they should make, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, and, and so there's a feeling, I think, the, the, the distance from decision-making centers. And I think this is something the center has to respond to as well. And in my book, I, I talk a bit about that. I have one more question. There's an argument coming up now for the Democratic Party that they should become more progressive and go in the Bernie Sanders, I suppose, direction. To me, that's dangerous because I think we need to appeal to other people out west, et cetera, et cetera. And we've got robotics, technology. It's become a problem. People don't realize that. I mean, people do realize, but they don't connect it, losing their jobs. There's a lot of convincing to do in this next election. Yeah. And I 
I'm worried that the Democratic Party may just go off in one direction and won't be inclusive enough. I'm I'm a strong believer. Actors, I guess. Strong believer in the Democratic the future of the Democratic Party is best when it moves toward the center. And uh, if it moves too far to the left, it will it will not succeed. And uh, there is a great opportunity right now for the Democratic Party to capture independent and uh, Republicans who don't like Trump as a, as a, a very effective center there. I think some great ideas come from the left. Bernie's had a lot of great ideas. He's had some bad ideas, but he's got a lot of great ideas. I like the fact that he, his progressive agenda does put the finger on problems. Like, We've got to deal with this. But the solutions are never going to be out on the left. They're going to be in the middle. And they're never going to be perfect, but that's where we have to find the solutions. So I agree with you completely. Yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.